I'm Kim Amidzik. I'm superintendent of schools. And as we were discussing before we started the presentation, uh, I'm alumni of the district and um, coming back to my hometown to serve and support learning in our community. And uh, Jonathan Mitchell is uh, here with us this evening. He is the director of business services and he is also a resident of the community. He loves us so much that he bought a home here and is um, so we are both residents and invested in the in Greendale and the, the schools in the community. So our goal and our purpose this evening with what we'll be sharing with you, Jonathan, you're gonna drive, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, is first to talk about what we do in with budget development, how we annually plan for and, and drive a budget. Um, we're gonna talk about, and this is the 101 part of it, how schools get money and what the state funding formula is and the impact of state funding formulas on the money that is used to, to support students. What is the projected budget and the property tax levy as we're looking to the 23-24 school year and what is gonna be happening next? So that is what we'll be sharing with you this evening. And uh, this is, again, being recorded for anyone who is interested. So if you hear something interesting tonight, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, uh, so that they can get a better understanding of how school funding works. So the goals for our budget. Um, it's important that our budget reflect um, resources focused on students. And so we make decisions about allocating funds to ensure that we are putting the time and money towards the areas that matter. And that's driven by our strategic plan. So we set uh, a mission and a vision of cultivating excellence in every student. And we've identified some priority areas that will help us achieve that vision. And so we are intentionally looking at the budget to determine how we can allocate resources to serve those priority areas. And we want as much as possible for that to have an impact on our students in the, in the classroom. And we work really hard to make sure that we are being responsible and efficient in our use of dollars to achieve our goals um, because those tax dollars are hard earned from all of our community members, including me. And we wanna make sure that they're allocated efficiently so that we don't need to tax more than necessary. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jonathan who's gonna talk about, oh, before I turn it over to Jonathan, this is our focus. So as we're building that budget, these are our priorities the students in the classroom and making sure that they are getting access to all of the tools, resources, and instruction that they need to become excellent and to, to strive towards excellence. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Jonathan, who's gonna talk about the process that we use to build a budget. So we try to keep it simple and try to explain this into four steps because you can summarize all the detail that we're doing and um, get it down to these four steps. So first, we want to identify needs. So very purposefully, if you're designing programming for students, you want to start by understanding the whole scope of what's changing. And so what that'll look like is going to the school building level and having conversations with the team and understanding what may be changing and what we need to provide in terms of programming for the upcoming year. Then the second step understanding and projecting what spendable revenues are available to provide programming, which leads to step three, comparing those two and prioritizing the things that are going to have the most impact for our students. And then the fourth step, refining that budget to put it into balance. So matching up the program expenditures with the spendable revenues that are available. And so we have different guiding tools to do that. And what's most important to us is our strategic mission and vision. We're working to cultivate excellence in every student. And so we use that and how we're going to work through these steps and get to the refinement of programming within the spendable revenues available. And so as we're doing that work, we're trying to understand the staffing needs and that's driven by class size targets. We talked about student programming and understanding the complexity of student needs within that program. We're thinking about the educational tools in the classroom to drive instruction and the curriculum that's going to support that instruction. 
And then what is the infrastructure? What do we need in terms of our facilities so that everyone can be successful? So as a guiding document, we have both that mission and vision, and we also utilize a tool which we call the budgetary principles document, which lays out 10 principles we will use when we have to make tough decisions around fixed resources. And so we've highlighted a few of those here to give a sample of what those are. And so as a team, we've agreed that these are what we're going to use. When we're trying to make those decisions of refining the budget and prioritizing programming. So we're going to be positive and put students first in our thinking of how we're creating the budget. We're also going to be driven by data. So what is the data that supports that this is a wise investment of limited resources? We need to make sure that we have sufficient resources to meet our curriculum needs. So as the curriculum and instruction team is working together to make any changes or updates on the annual basis, what type of resources will we need to ensure all students have access to that curriculum? We're gonna make sure that we are working towards equity and equality in how resources are allocated so that all students have the things they need and all students have equal opportunities um, based on the needs of their particular programming. And then we're gonna utilize possibilities thinking. So sometimes we're faced with very difficult um, budgetary challenges and we have to step back and look through different lenses to figure out how to solve a problem in a new way to try and match those spendable revenues with the programming that we need for our students. So this graph represents the total population of school-aged children in the Greendale community. And what you see is that 91.1% of the students who reside in Greendale choose the public schools. And we are honored that they made that choice. Um, we think that it shows that by um, attracting that level of market share that our schools and our programming are meeting the needs of our students. Uh, and then there is a percentage of the population, 9%, who are school-aged children who are not choosing the public schools. And we understand that. And part of what we're looking to understand is what is it about the market that is making them make other choices? You can see that that 1.5% of our students are choosing homeschool. And we also, of that 3.5% in open enrollment, we have a number of students choosing virtual school. And while we don't have a virtual school, we have um, established some new partnerships. So one of the last budget principles that we talked about was possibilities thinking. And so as we're thinking about possibilities for the resident students in our district and how to ensure that they have access to services that um, make them choose Greendale schools as part of their marketplace, we've innovated and worked with a, a, a group called the Field Workshop to offer academic enrichment courses that support students and families who are choosing homeschool and open enrollment to virtual schools to have those hands-on social engagement activities to support their learning. And at some point that may be something that, that brings revenue to the district. At this time, uh, we're piloting and experimenting with a break-even cost structure. Um, so we feel strongly that we want to make sure that what we're doing with our budget and with our programming is serving the needs of the students students in our community and our public schools are serving 91% of the resident students. Um, and we are attracting more open enrollment than are leaving our district, uh, which is all a good thing in terms of, of uh, response to our um, service and our budget. So uh, we are targeting one of the priorities of the community has been small classes. And so we are targeting class sizes based on the grade level and the developmental needs of the students. And that is an important facet of uh, constructing our budget as we think about what staffing we're going to need because 86% of our budget is staffing. And to make sure that we have uh, our staffing needs met, we need to know how many students are, can be in each classroom. Um, we've kept these class sizes low based on community demand. 
Uh, so there are a couple of, of courses where we exceed these targets. For example, music performance, uh, our band is larger than 30 students in every, any given class period. And our physical education classes, we go up to 40 students um, in our high school physical education classes, not our elementary and middle school, but our, our high school physical education classes are slightly larger as well. So then the second step, we are working towards projecting those revenue allocations. So what funding is going to be available to provide programming for students? And so if we're talking in our school finance 101 framework. We want to go back a little bit. So we've got to go back 30 years with the establishment of revenue limits. So prior to that time, local school boards would just decide what is the appropriate spendable revenue increase and they could tax um, based, based on what that need was for programming. And so to control the amount and the speed at which taxes were increasing for some local communities, the state put spending limits and caps in place in 1993. And so that set a per pupil dollar, per student dollar for each Wisconsin school district as well as per pupil funding levels for open enrollment, charter and choice schools. So that's 30, 30 years ago, those revenue limits go into place. And that district revenue limit was based on the number of students times whatever that per pupil funding amount was for the year. And that funding amount through the revenue limit was based on two primary sources. So you have dollars that are coming from state equalization aid, so the state aid bucket, and then dollars that are coming from property taxes. And how much is coming through each would vary based on community. But in total, you would have a total revenue limit cap based on that student's times per pupil funding dollar. So that was in place starting in 1993. In 2012, 13, there is a parallel program that came into place at the state level that was a per pupil aid allocation. So separate from the revenue limit. And that model was different and that all of the dollars for that pupil aid was funded entirely through state aid funding. So instead of having a bucket that's filled some out of property tax and some out of state aid, those dollars at which that are the per pupil aid allocation are entirely funded through state aid. So again, revenue limit to, to point out that relationship, you have the revenue limit. Hey, Mitchell, authority. sorry, just a quick yeah. question. What give me an example of someone that would be completely state funded? Would that be like Milwaukee or what type of district are we talking? So uh, through the revenue That's limit cool. model, saying like who would have a higher percentage that would come through state aid versus yeah. funding and property taxes. So that's gonna be related to your property value per student member, right? So if you had a community that had a high level of student participation and like a lot of students per household and your overall property valuation was lower, let's say you had less business than uh, other communities. If your property value per student is low, your percentage of aid under the revenue limit is high. So let's think of a couple examples. Uh, Milwaukee Public Schools would be one where the level of aid would be high because your property valuation per student compared to a statewide average is relatively low. And then on the opposite end of that, you could have uh, like Door County. And you think about that, there's a lot of vacation homes. There are a lot of homes where individuals may just be living there part-time or they're retired in those locations. So there's fewer students per household. And so in that community, the property valuation per student would be very high, much higher than the statewide level. So that means when they get to the revenue limit, then the percentage that comes through state aid is very low and the percentage that is coming through property taxes is very high. Does that, Amy, does that help explain a yeah. little bit? Okay. That that's makes that's basically what I thought. Just wanted to be clear. So thank yep. you. Yeah, for sure. That's good. So for Greendale schools, 
that revenue limit makes up about 86% of our general fund, our operational fund revenues. And then that state aid, that's a portion of that revenue limit is based on um, aidable costs. So what has our spending been in the prior year, our membership, our student enrollment, and then equalized property valuation. So that those last two items getting to that property valuation per student, that portion of the state equalization aid model. So um, more specifically, um, revenue limit based on past spending, then the state imposed increase or decrease per student. So state law has to provide for any changes in the per student amount each year. So if it's $10,000 this year, but next year it's gonna be 10,200, that would have to be because the state legislature approved a $200 increase in that per student amount. Um, and then for revenue limit purposes, to help with fluctuations that are happening, it uh, averages over a three-year student enrollment trend. So you're constantly on that rolling average for total student count. So I think this highlights that point. We had a couple slides ago, that question, those with a high property value per student would be funded by a higher portion of property taxes and smaller state revenues, which is within their bucket, which is the revenue cap. And those districts that would have a lower property value per student funded lower percentage of property taxes and higher state revenues. So one of those components is that three-year membership average. So a way that you can get more dollars under the revenue limit is if you have more students that you're educating, even if that per student amount were staying the same, if the bucket's getting bigger in terms of the number of students you're serving, that's gonna change your overall revenue limit. And so for the Greendale community, we've seen an increase over the last decade of about 250 students, which would be about 12% of our resident student population from 10 years ago. And as Dr. Midzik pointed out earlier, about 91% of those students in the com Greendale community um, are attending the Greendale Public Schools. So this has been a reflection on, um, on uh, Greendale continuing to be uh, a choice destination community for families. And we've seen some of the turnover in our households where we've got some younger families that are coming in and certainly have a reflection in that enrollment where we're seeing enrollment growth, while at the same time, the typical community is seeing flat enrollment to declining enrollment. So then taking a look at how that total revenue limit buckets filled up. So we said over that 10 year period of time, that overall bucket's getting bigger as we've increased the number of students that we're providing education for. Um, and here is showing the relationship of overall tax levy versus equalization aid. So the number in, or the, I'm sorry, the chart in blue is showing the dollars of equalization aid going back to the 2011, 12 school year. And then in the orange, the total tax levy. So we are, actually below, slightly below the overall tax levy that the Greendale schools had in the 2011-12 school year, um, while at the same time, uh, we see the large increase in the amount of equalization aid. So under the formula, because we've, we're have we growing in the number of students that we have as a community, we're seeing that we are faring better in the equalization aid formula as the state uh, through state aid, a larger portion of that revenue limit is coming through state aid. Jonathan, I just want to point out that the slight increase in the local levy in 2019 20 uh, is, is a result of the uh, building referendum that was approved by the community at a rate of 67%. That is when you see uh, the local tax levy go up slightly because the voters approved it for the building projects that we did. And the twenty nine or the nineteen twenty one, the twenty nineteen through twenty twenty one biennium budget, um, you see a steep increase in state equalization aid because the state legislature added more money 
to uh, the funding form to fund schools from the state level, but the overall uh, revenue limit did not change. Uh, so it, it offset uh, local property taxes. And then you see that decline in property taxes as a result. So getting to the overall increase. So we talked about the revenue limit from 1993. And there was also a companion part to the revenue limit, which is how much should the per student spendable revenues increase on an annual basis. So going back to 1998, that was set at $200 per student and then an annual increase tied to the consumer price index. So if the first year it started at $200 and then inflation was 3%, you would take 3% of $200 and the second year you would set the per pupil amount at $206. So it was designed to slowly increase over time and so you as a school district could predict those dollars and then build programming around that. So the index increased over about a 10 year time period from $200 to $274 per student. So slowly going up based on that inflationary index and then was suspended, that indexing was suspended um, due to the um, national recession and loss of state dollars that were available for spending on governmental programming. So there's a change that's made in 2009. And then from 2009 through 2023, those annual increases have varied. And we'll have some of that data on the next slide uh, here. So under that prior indexing resource, so we see in the first column, as that was what that would have been as that increase from $274 had that model stayed in place that would have continued to increase to $274 per student all the way to $371. So over a 15 year period of time, that would have been a total of spendable revenues of $4,651. And so the change was made in 2009. So we see in 2009, 10 and 10, 11, $200 per student. And then there was actually a significant adjustment down of $554 and per student spending that was tied to Act 10 and required contributions to state retirement and then changes that were made locally to health insurance benefits to offset that reduction in revenue limit. And then from the 10 years after that time, um, per pupil allocation of anywhere between $0 and 263. And so we have those amounts listed. And so if you total the dollars over that 15 year period of time, that's $1,400 in spendable revenue. So the difference versus that prior indexing versus the middle column here that's showing the actual spendable per student dollars comes to $3,234 per student. And so- Another quick question. Yeah. So the union then, obviously, if Act 10 affected that and having to pay more insurance and whatnot, that affects the revenue. So it's there; those aren't separate budgetary line items at the state level. They're all one. Or how does that work? Kim, do you want me to take that one? You can take it. So going back a slide. So there were the Act 10 limited collective bargaining. And so they changed the parameters under which school districts could negotiate um, and provided much more flexibility um, and over how the district approached salary negotiations and how the district handled benefits. So we as a school district, the leadership team, has ongoing conversations with the union. So we have a represented teachers union in Greendale. We have had since Act 10 all the way until now. They have continued to recertify. So on an annual basis, um, the team will have conversations, but the board has the ability to make decisions in terms of um, approving of salary and benefits each year. 
there is there is collective bargaining is limited to base wage bargaining so there will be an inflationary salary number which the district is required to um, work and negotiate with the represented union but that is a limitation on bargaining so from a cost structure the district um, has the ability uh, to manage that um, how how they would decide in 11 12 specifically when that change occurred the there was state law requirement regarding contributing half of the retirement share of um, district benefits that half of that retirement be contributed by the employee and prior to that the full share was contributed by the district so that split occurred um, there was also requirements of state government to uh, increase the contribution for health insurance and there due to the significant cut in spendable revenues most all school districts across the state also made similar changes in increasing contribution levels for health insurance so those were two items that happened budgetarily in 2011 12 in order to get budgets in balance and account for that reduction in spendable revenues so as you're looking at the large picture our revenue is one bucket um, and how we allocate that revenue is a local decision. And that's the process that we're talking about in terms of what we do. When the, the increases were reduced, um, the state legislature also gave, gave districts tools to reduce costs. And those cost reductions were uh, retirement benefits and cost sharing around uh, health insurance. And we as a school district used those tools and those levers to present a balanced budget um, and continue to provide for our students. No, that's great. That makes sense. And I'm uh, all for more local control for sure. So like that. So that cumulative difference. So there's a state budget crisis that happens in 2009. 2011, there's that big drop in revenue limit. So the cumulative difference between what's been available as new spendable revenue per student versus uh, using that old inflationary adjustment that had been created in 1998, just over that 15 year period of time, uh, $3,235. So we wanted to take a look at that of how that compares versus other states. So if we look for the, the period the longest period of time that's available from US Census Bureau data, um, going back to 2002 to 2020, which is the latest data um, over that period of time, the percentage increase in per student spending would rank 48th in the country. And as a result, Wisconsin has gone from 11th in per student overall spending to 25th. And so that's prior to the last biennial budget, the 21-23 biennial budget, where there was a freeze in new per student spending. So we said under the revenue limit, that adjustment for new per pupil amount, that would come through legislation. So that would be adopted through the state budget. And so what that means is Wisconsin is falling behind in its investment in kids. So we also are looking through the context of the inflationary environment that we are in. So we talked about the col collective bargaining and the current limitations on that to deal with base wages. And so the Wisconsin Employment Relations Commission, which is the acronym WERC, will annually set that amount that school districts are allowed to negotiate with the teachers union. And so for the 20... 22 year, our current school year, uh, that was set at 4.7%. And now based on continued high inflation, that will go up to 8% for the 23-24 school year. So that sets the cap at which school districts can negotiate, but is a reflection of the 40 year high inflation that we have right now. And so B 
beyond just a labor cost. We think about our instructional and support staff. We have labor costs when we're dealing with our bus contracts, uh, driver wages, other support staff in our districts. When we think about our operations, we're thinking about our electrical, our lights and heat for our, our buildings, our supplies. If we're trying to purchase new textbooks or curriculum, those have been impacted by inflationary increases, as well as any capital projects. So if we need to renovate a curricular space. So right now we're working on a project for summer of 2023 for our middle school wood shop. Well, we're seeing the impact of cost to do um, a replacement of equipment and replacement of HVAC equipment within that space um, due to the inflationary costs. It's just becoming increasingly difficult to do that with limited funds that we would have to do that type of project. And I wanna comment that uh, we can negotiate up to 4.7% uh, for this year with our teachers and our teachers agreed to a smaller percentage increase on base wages um, when we uh, settled our negotiations earlier this year. So we've got three pressures as we think about how we build the budget and provide that programming for students. There is one lens where we're trying to provide that programming that will meet the needs of students in academic recovery. So we saw that in our data um, following the beginning of the pandemic, and there was that initial dip in our student achievement data and our focus and and our investment of time and resources has been how can we work quickly to help support our students getting back on track from a growth and achievement standpoint. And then the second is the revenue freeze in the last biennial budget. So that spending freeze on the per student basis through the revenue limit. And then the third are those inflationary costs. And so those three items put pressure on the district as we start thinking about providing programming for this upcoming year. And then when we look at how our expenditures break down across our general operating fund, which is our fund 10 general fund expenditures, about 70% of that fund is made up of salaries and benefits because we are a service provider. We have adult staff that are working with students. Uh, we have 15%, which is in our purchase services. So we think about all of our utility costs and transportation costs and repairs that we need to make to our buildings throughout the year and other contracted services we may need to support our schools, make up our purchase services. And then our fourth biggest bucket is our fund 27, which is for special education services. So any student that has an individual IEP plan for specialized services, we as a district need to account for dollars within our general fund budget for anything that will be above and beyond what is reimbursed at the state and federal level. And so what we find is uh, about two thirds of the cost of that special education is through that local transfer. So those dollars that are allocated and about a third that is coming through state and federal funding. Um, and we know that the legislature has been looking closely at that um, and been engaging in conversations uh, about it as we proceed um, and made a shift in that funding level for special education in the last biennial budget. And so I think we'll mention that um, in an upcoming slide as we talk about public policy priorities. So those are some of our key costs in building that operations budget. So then as we work towards projecting for the 23-24 school year, so next school year, so we created three different scenarios and we'll just step through these quickly. And in each scenario, we have different revenue assumptions because at this point, the state legislature is working hard at building a budget for the next two years that will go into place in July for 2023 through 2025. 
And so we need to plan different models based on what that budget could be. So if there were no new spendable revenues as there were in the last two year biennial budget, so we would be looking at operational revenues of 34.3 million and operating expenses of 36.8 million. So it'd be a $2.5 million deficit for next year. In scenario two, we made an assumption of $200 per student in new spendable revenue in the first year and $250 in the second year of the biennial budget. And then we had mentioned the reimbursement for special education. So assuming that that had increased from 30% to 35% next year and then 40% the year after. Um, so in that case, the deficit would decrease um, to $1.75 million on total expenditures of 36.5 million. Scenario three, looked at revenues per student of $1,510 combined. So if $1,107 per student spendable revenue was added in 23-24, and an additional $403 in the second year of the biennial. And that model, that scenario, we would see a budget surplus of $150,000 on a $36.8 million budget. And so that scenario three would be going back to the discussion we had earlier, going all the way back to 1998, um, that state legislature model for indexing per student revenues based on inflation um, if you pull those numbers forward by 21-22, that would be $342 per student. And based on projected inflationary numbers by 2024-25 would be $403. So you see those four annual amounts. So this would assume a catch up from the last biennial budget for the two years where there was a revenue freeze and then provide additional spendable revenue for the next two years. And so that would get to a spendable revenue request of $1,510. So as the administration, <clears throat> excuse me, is working with the Board of Education and uh, beginning to prioritize our spending, that uh, third step in our budget process, we start with the needs analysis, look at projected revenues and then start to prioritize our spending so that we can get closer to a balanced budget. Uh, we have identified scenario two as the most conservative option for budgeting without saying um, where we're at, without saying they won't, the state legislature would give zero increases. They have uh, discussed uh, quite a bit about the need to uh, do increases now that ESSER dollars are sunsetting. And um, so we don't think that it will be zero uh, and we wanna be conservative so that we don't overpromise our community uh, what we think it will be. So we selected scenario two, which is a $200 per pupil increase in uh, the 23-24 school year, which was projected to be a deficit of 1,745, $1,745,000. Uh, we spent some time evaluating and prioritizing and identified budget saving measures in the amount of $490,000. And that is not enough to cover a $1.7 million shortfall. And so we have an updated budget deficit of $1,255,000. We have also looked at changing some of our assumptions around teacher salaries and reducing the level of increase to get us closer to balanced. Uh, but we believe that it's important to value the work that teachers are doing and the, the hard work that they're doing in the classroom and that they have some offsetting inflationary increases based on the cost of living they're experiencing in their lives. Uh, we don't want to have them lose ground in the profession and choose to leave the profession, which some have done. So we wanna honor and value our teachers in the classroom and. Uh, while we're looking to reduce the amount of increase, we're not looking to eliminate the amount of increase altogether. Um, I did, we have been, uh, hold on. So the state, as the, we move forward with the state budget and, and how those projections will become closer to actuals, 
um, the state, you can advance the slide, Jonathan, uh, the state budget for 23-25, and you can advance again. Um, this is the process where we're at. So in the budget timeline, uh, we have provided, uh, we have had uh, a governor has delivered a budget. There's been some advocacy activities and some opportunities for us to talk with our state lawmakers. Um, I did notice that Representative Wickers has joined the conversation and I truly value the time that he has invested in trying to understand how school funding works. Uh, we've had a couple of conversations and he is very engaged in that process to understand uh, how to make sure that we continue to provide exceptional education and instruction for our students within a reasonable budget that maintains reasonable taxes for the residents of our district. So I do appreciate his willingness to engage in the conversation and learn more about how school funding works so that he can make good decisions for the residents. Um, so we are in this process now where advocacy efforts and, the, and feedback and listening sessions for the Joint Finance Committee are coming to an end and the state legislature will be engaging in conversations. Hey, I had another, just a little question and I, I apologize. I'm, this is probably commonly known for you guys, but I, I don't understand how it works now with regard to teacher salaries. Are you able to, you know, scorecard and reward some teachers more than others? Does it have to be level set because there's still union involvement? Um, how does that work? Um, the leveling and the, the amount of increase can be set for, um, a merit system, we have not engaged in a merit-based system as when we evaluate our teachers, uh, the vast majority of them, uh, 90 to 95% of them are being ranked as effective or distinguished. And so it would be difficult to give 90% more. And we do have a way to freeze if they're not meeting acceptable, but it is very difficult to measure. And what we have found in the conversations is that it creates competition between teachers to get access to the higher revenue based on merit that actually hurts students because they stop collaborating and sharing. Um, and so they, they start to uh, change their behaviors in a way that doesn't benefit students. So we have chosen to engage in a pro to set up a model in which uh, teachers get a planned, a predictable, increase provided that they continue to provide quality instruction in the classroom as evaluated. Um, so rather than pitting them against each other for the limited resources, everyone who is is effective or distinguished gets uh, an increase of that nature. And just that for clarity, effective or distinguished, that's the rating scale used by the principal of the school to give them their evaluations, similar to like a three point or five point scale in the corporate world. Yep, so in a four-point scale in the corporate world, that would be a three or a four. Got it. And how often do we kind of reevaluate just as a whole of, you know, if that competition really is a, a, a negative versus a positive? Yeah, so... Is that looked at over again, or has, is that just kind of a standard now? Uh, we, the last time we looked at it was 2018. Uh, we made some adjustments to our structure and our predictable increases. Uh, so it's been about five years since we last looked at it. Uh, and we do evaluate our uh, compensation in the market on a regular basis. And we open the door to have conversations about if we need to change our, our compensation structure in any way, either moving to a merit-based system or predictable or adjusting the amounts within the salary structure to get to um, the our best efforts to uh, attract and retain high quality staff. And that is what we have in our, so when we talk about those priorities that we set, one of our uh, priorities in the strategic plan is to attract and retain high quality staff to best serve the, our students. So that is part of our consideration when we are looking at uh, compensation models and structures. Thank you. And sorry to stop you again. No, sharing. that is an important question. <laughs> And hey, you know, we, we need good teachers because I'll tell you, the houses aren't what drives the market up here, right? So you are absolutely right. A lot of people paying a lot to uh, gut their house. So. <laughs> Thank you. So on the next slide, we 
highlighted the funds that are available. So right now, the state has set aside $1.7 billion in a rainy day fund, and then is looking at a budget surplus for the end of the current two-year biennium. And so that the latest projection um, was at $7.1 billion, which would make about $8.8 billion available. And so one of the discussions then um, for the state legislature is what are the new projected revenues for the state budget and what investments uh, may be made and how will those be made in the upcoming biennial budget. So we've discussed with uh, the Board of Education a number of scenarios as they consider uh, as a board what their priorities are in public policy at the state level. And what we have, the, the board passed a resolution that was presented to our state legislature legislators in March um, and that included that 1510 in spendable revenue over the biennium. And we also, uh, as a, the board set a 60% reimbursement for special education and funding to provide highly qualified mental health services uh, in that space. So these are the areas that they said, these are high priorities to meet those needs that we identified in our budget cycle. And uh, here's what we, we want to see um, from a taxing authority revenue limit perspective. Um, if those are not increased, you see that we have a budget shortfall. We are in the process of discussing with the board the, uh, do we want to use our fund balance, which is uh, slightly different than the rainy day, they call it the rainy day fund at the state that Jonathan just showed, um, but it is a, an amount that we have set aside. Board policy requires that we maintain 15% um, in our fund balance, and we are just over 20% at this time. So that is of our total operational costs. And there is conversation about for the 23-24 school year, do we need to use some of that uh, fund balance to manage our costs? And if we do not have, we, we have hope that the state legislature will uh, work together to come to an increase that helps meet the needs of the students in our schools. And if the state is not able to get to a dollar value where we are able to have a balanced budget of needs and um, revenue authority, that we would have conversations about the possibility of an operational referendum to ask the local taxpayers what they're willing to invest in the schools and um, have a local control opportunity there. So those are in discussions at the board level as we're thinking about setting our budget. So I mentioned that we uh, shared our public policy priorities. This was our day at the Capitol. And then uh, uh, Mr. Mitchell, uh, I'm sorry, Jonathan Mitchell and Kathy Weed Vincent and I testified at the Joint Finance Committee um, listening sessions around those public policy priorities set by the board. Um, and we believe that there will be a state uh, allowable revenue increase um, that will get us closer to getting to a balanced budget for the 23-24 school year. So one area that we didn't talk about was the ESSER stimulus funding. So through the federal legislation, there were three rounds of federal funding that were provided on a one-time basis to assist schools with the academic recovery for students, as well as safety for all building users. So as the district approached the utilization of those funds, worked to split those funds between those two priorities and work to invest those funds um, in programming that we knew would make a difference for, for our schools. And so specifically funding was invested into instructional support specialists. So identifying needs and gaps of students and supporting students and teachers and strategies to help in that academic recovery and academic growth of students. Then we invested a large portion of revenues into the UNIVENTS for heating and 
yeah, outside airflow at Highland View Elementary. So those unit events dated back to the 1960s. And so they were at about three times what would be typical for that type of equipment. Equipment usually lasts 20 years. Those were at 60 years old. Um, so that was an important investment to improve indoor air quality. We've also provided additional nursing and health room staff to support students and families throughout the pandemic, as well as other work for providing heating, ventilation, and cooling for fresh outside air um, and safety of our building users. So those have been the main investments of that um, through those one-time dollars. And so here's a picture of the allocation for each of those three rounds of funding stimulus. So you'll see it grows. The first allocation was 232,000. The second allocation was just over a million dollars. And then the third round was $2.4 million. And then on the bottom, the related expenditures. So the time period to expend the first round of dollars has passed and the district utilized all those funds. The second round of dollars, we have spent about 60% of those funds or $654,000. The remaining funds are being invested in HVAC upgrades at College Park Elementary. And so a project that we will do this summer to improve HVAC and indoor air quality at College Park. And those dollars are required to be spent by the end of September of this year of 2023. And then the remaining dollars, ESSER 3, uh, we have about $700,000 and those remaining dollars will be split between investment and instructional support specialists through next school year, as well as um, heating, ventilation, and cooling projects in the district. So again, that, that balance. And with that, um, that will be the end of the investment of those one-time dollars. The vast majority of what's remaining will be expended by the end of summer 2023 um, with some remaining dollars that will be available through ESSER 3 through the 23-24 school year. What's the, um, the specialists? Are those consultants? Are those full-time? They are staff members, and it was an investment in academic recovery. So they are uh, three of the five that were added. We have one per building. Are have been teachers in our district who are um working with all teachers for real-time in-class professional development to help focus on the standards and realign uh, instruction to the standards to help, help increase the number of students that are reading at grade level and uh, do, performing math at grade level. Um, usually, we, they, we intended for them to be temporary or to um, shift the number of kids who need intervention because we're targeting in the classroom instruction, uh, but that kind of change takes three to five years to happen. And so we see some impact with the improvement in test scores and we see are seeing some decline in our need for intervention, uh, but we have not tipped the scales yet to, to start to see that intervention need um, reduce at a rate that we're ready to eliminate them. So um, they have really, their role is um, partial classroom coaching, partial direct interaction with students to provide support and intervention. And then it's probably not a topic for this, but um, would are what they're working on or their ideas or what they're looking to change or implement, is that going to be covered like in school board or just some of the things that they were going to be working on specifically to increase those scores or where would we yeah. hear about that? Yes. Yes, they, we have done some coverage of that as we talk about our um, short cycle goals. So our, we have a scorecard that gives annual goals for the superintendent and the district. Uh, and then three times a year, we report on progress towards those goals and the impact of our efforts to move towards those goals. And all five of our schools have uh, specific academic achievement goals and targeted on some of their tasks that are presented. So we did a presentation in November 
Um, we did one in February and there will be another one in June about the work of those instructional support specialists and how they're um, contributing to uh, growth and impact in our achievement outcomes. Awesome. And is that going to just be online again or how would we find that? Yeah, so it's it's part of the school board meeting. So if you go oh, back okay. to the school board meetings and find the agendas where it's at, and I don't have the date off the top of my head. I know it was November. I know it was February. Um, you'll be able to to see those, and there's school presentations that will. Um, it, you don't have to watch it because they're in written report form. Um, but okay. you can hear some of the the input from those instructional support specialists themselves. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So then we want to provide some information on the tax levy because there's a couple different components that make up what you see on the tax bill. So if I was picking up my village tax bill for my house and looking at what's listed as the school tax levy, that number would be the bottom number that's listed here. So the total tax levy with a tax incremental district and vouchers added. So there's uh, three different buckets that we list here. And so the first is the school portion of the tax levy. So that makes up the tax levy that's related to the general fund for operations, debt funds, so referendums that the community has approved. So Dr. Midzik mentioned the 2018 referendum and there's annual levy that goes into paying off debt that was taken out for that project. There's also the community services fund. So um, there we're expanding beyond educational programming. We're talking about programming for the whole community. So the portion of that programming um, that's taxed through the school tax levy. And then there's $200,000 annually that the board sets aside. It's actually under our revenue limit, but the board specifically in the community at the annual meeting approves for that to be set aside for facilities, investment, and upgrades. So the total of that for this last year was 14,902,000. And so that would make up about 93% of what you would see on the tax bill itself. Um, so then outside of the school district control, what gets added is there is funding for private school vouchers. So on an annual basis, the school district will get information about students that have participated in private school vouchers. So we showed that chart at the beginning of the conversation with the percentage of students that are in private school programming. And so we don't get specifics on which students have vouchers, but assumably based on the data we've collected, there's overlap of those students. And so this is amount that as that voucher information comes in, it's required to be a tax levy that's done by the local governing school board. So even though we do not provide the programming um, through Greendale schools, the school board in Greendale is required to add that to the, the school levy. So the amount that is approved um, when the board sets the tax levy in October is that amount that includes vouchers. And so that's about 96% of what you would have seen for this last year. And then the remaining amount is the tax incremental districts. So overlapping tax incremental districts that are at the South Ridge property. And so the village, along with the other overlapping taxing entities, so MATC and the county, um, get together and have conversations as part of the joint review board for those tax incremental districts. And then when those levies go through on an annual basis, they're apportioned out. And so the amount that is um, added for the Greendale schools portion um, of those TIFs actually went down substantially for 2022 and was at 678,000, which is about 4% of what's on that school tax levy. So that amount gets added and then you get to a final school tax levy amount. From a tax levy and mill rate perspective, so here going back, we had charts earlier in the presentation, going back to the 11, 12 school year, about $16 million. As we had mentioned, the 2019 
2020 school year, the addition of the um, referendum from 2018 in terms of total tax levy. And then we've seen some decrease um, in that tax levy over the last three years. And then the green line chart reflecting total mill rate. So for every thousand dollars of assessed property value, how much is taxed? And so there we see that amount has changed over time as property valuation has um, increased, the total amount for each thousand dollars has decreased. And you see that going all the way from $12.67 at the high um, to $9.01 on the last tax bill. So as we project for next year, um, with the revenue assumptions we had provided earlier, we would expect the school tax levy to stay flat. So overall school tax levy with vouchers being at 15,336,000, so staying flat. And then with some increase to property valuation would expect that mill rate, the levy per thousand dollars of property valuation to go down to $8.74. Those are projected figures and will change based on additional information including what we um, get as an update from the state uh, as to the state budget and spendable revenues for the 23-24 year. A couple last slides. So one, we wanna talk about what we do are regarding collaboration and savings to be efficient in programming. So one is we're able to leverage as a small school district with a small business office, cooperative agreements. So we're able to leverage and piggyback off of state contracts that exist to get the pricing that's been negotiated to the state. But oftentimes they negotiate that and allow school districts to participate. And so when it comes to things like copier contracts, or if we need to rent a vehicle for a special event, we can take advantage of that negotiation that's already been done at the state level and not have to dedicate additional staff to do purchasing to go back and renegotiate those same contracts. Um, we also work to share services with the village of Greendale. So example there would be school resource officers that we have. So we have two school resource officers that we share between village and school district. We also share an IT director position. So working to ensure that we can get the maximum level of services for the community and figure out ways that make sense for us to partner together. As a school district, we've switched to self-insuring our health insurance. So working to try and minimize additional costs and fees that are built in to having health insurance benefits um, by working with our own consultant and negotiating those plans directly. There's some risk that's involved with that, but it's very calculated um, risk that the district takes on with the um, knowledge that over longer periods of time that you can um, save versus fully insured health insurance. So the size of our entity allows us to do that. The fourth is we've worked to prepay and refinance debt. So prior to interest rates um, really spiking up in the last two or three years, the district has worked to refinance outstanding debt to get the lowest interest rates possible so that we can save on interest payments as well as uh, make prepayments to debt to speed up the rate at which those um, fundings will come up. And then the last is future planning with the village of Greendale. So we're very excited that we're in a collaborative process right now discussing park and recreation and our indoor and outdoor facilities in a collaborative manner between the village and school district. And we're working together so we can do one study and create a vision of how we wanna utilize those spaces and work together and thinking about how we can share our resources to provide the best services within what we have available for our budget. So just wanted to highlight examples of some of the things that we do as we work towards- what other Sorry, yeah. one other quick question. Did we talk about what debt's out there? I might have missed that slide. We did not talk about okay. what debt was out there here in the conversation. That is something that we always visit at our annual meeting, um, but we do have a very small amount of debt 
that is remaining on the 2007 referendum that was done for facility upgrades at the high school. And so we are in the last couple years of payments on that debt. We have the 2018 referendum debt, which was originally $33.8 million that was loaned for upgrades across all of our facilities in the district. And so on an annual basis, we're making payments to that and have been able to start to set aside dollars um, to prepay um, some of that debt. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Jonathan, we also have the other post-employment benefits that was a renegotiating of retirement benefit in 2000. What year was that? But we're in the that, it was that it was originally issued? Yes. So originally issued in about 2005. And so there's an additional portion that is not part of a referendum, but in 2005 was chewing up the liability that existed with the state retirement fund. And that is another debt that we have prepaid and have a couple of years remaining before that finally falls off of our debt profile. But otherwise it's covered, it's just still on the books until the loan's closed? Yeah, because yeah. it was prepaid? Okay. Mm -hmm. So as we get to next steps for budget planning, the board is gonna review a preliminary budget for 23-24 on May 15th. And the board will approve a preliminary budget in June. And then in September, we will have our budget hearing where I'll present the annual budget and the community at the annual meeting, which is right after, um, we'll have the ability to vote on that uh, budget in an advisory capacity. So all residents, community members are able to vote if they're voting eligible in the community. And then in October, the board will get final data to um, finalize the budget and final student counts final state budget numbers so that the board can set a tax levy for the 23-24 school year. And then we will work to getting set up for the next um, budget cycle. So, so the May and June are internal and then the public ones September 18th. Correct. Got it. Correct. And by internal, it means the Board of Education is voting um, that yes, this is the budget we wanna take forward and ask the community about. So it's still a public process, but the only people voting at that time are the board members. Oh, okay, I understand. Thank you. So uh, we hope that we achieved our goals this evening of sharing with you some information about how school funding works and where we are in our budget planning process to allocate those resources where we started the presentation with the students in our classroom. And uh, we, these, we are innovative in our programming and what these students are, are our ASL students who graduated in June of 22, and they are signing the national anthem. So uh, we wanna continue to provide that high quality and high opportunity and high engagement environment with the funding that is allocated to us and to keep these faces at the center of our work. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for um, asking good questions. And we hope that uh, it's informative and an opportunity for the community to see, even in replay, uh, how we are building a budget in Greendale Schools.